Welcome, everyone. I am Maria Russo. I'm the children's books editor of the New York Times. And I am going to read the general intro remarks, and then I'll introduce our wonderful panelists who are going to join me up here. Welcome to the 19th Annual National Book Festival brought to you by the Library of Congress. This festival is free of charge thanks to the generosity of donors large and small. If you wish to make a donation, please do so on the festival app under the word donate on the app's homepage. We appreciate your support for this great celebration of books and reading. We hope this day inspires you to make use of the incomparable resources of the Library of Congress, your very own national library. You can visit us in person on Capitol Hill or on the web at loc.gov. We're thrilled to announce the library's brand new National Book Festival Presents series, which will extend the reach of the festival with more exciting book events at the library starting next month. Please check loc.gov for updates on all the programs for children as well as adults and ticketing for each one. And I know about one of them, Dave Pilkey. There's gonna be a Dave Pilkey day, so anyone with younger kids. Um, so we're gonna welcome your questions at the end of our presentation. And if you have one for our authors, try to keep it brief and to the point. And if you do ask questions, you're giving us permission to use it for the webcast. And finally, please turn off your cell phones. Thank you. Okay, so now um, I am so happy to introduce our YA author panelists. We're gonna be talking about difficult topics uh, in YA. Um, we have Jared Krakoshka. Did I say oh, it right? No, it's okay. <laughs> so close. <laughs> so We're close. close at all. So close. <laughs> Krasoska. Krasoska. Um, he is the author of many books for young readers, including, I'll just, just off the top of my head, the Lunch Lady series, which you may know. His YA book, that is the reason he's up here today, Hey Kiddo, was published last year. Thank you. Um, Thanks. To wide acclaim. Um, that's Jarrett. Uh, we also have Monica Hess, who is a, a Hessa. Hesse. Hesse. <laughs> Why didn't I check before? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> she is um, a columnist right here in Washington at the Washington Post and also writes these incredible historical novels, The Girl in the Blue Coat, American Fire, <laughs> and she has a book coming, uh, and then, of course, the book coming in the spring is called... They Went Left. They Went Left. And the book that's out now, which I'm, I just uh, should have written down also. The War Outside. The War Outside. All, all of them historical novels. And um, uh, so we have two different kinds of difficult subject matter that you guys deal with. Um, so why don't we start with just a little bit of an introduction to your books and why you chose to write about the topics that you write about. So do you want to start, Jarrett? Sure. Uh, hey Kiddo is a, a graphic memoir. So oftentimes people will say it's a graphic novel memoir, and that is incorrect because you would never say something is a novel memoir, right? So it's a graphic memoir, so it's a memoir about my own life told in the format of a comic. And it's uh, about my upbringing, uh, being surrounded by addiction, uh, my mother's addiction to heroin, uh, my grandparents' alcoholism. My, I was raised by my grandparents because of my mother's heroin addiction. Uh, and it's all about my wanting to be an artist when I grew up and about how, the, how art really saved me and booed me through all of those experiences. And Monica? So The War Outside, um, as Maria said, most of my books are historical fiction. And while I was researching a previous book, I came across this, this photo that I was, I was just deeply curious about. It was a photo of a young woman who was uh, wearing a tiara and carrying a scepter and she had a sash on that said prom queen and um and then i learned that she was the prom queen of her internment camp in world war ii and i was just really deeply interested in in what kind of school she would have attended and what kind of life she would have lived that she was that she was the prom queen of her internment camp so I wrote The War Outside to explore this period of American history through the, through the eyes of, um, of teenagers who were growing up in it. And what about the idea that you were writing for teenagers about topics that many of the adults in their lives might be a little uncomfortable about? How did you both approach that 
that challenge? Well, we probably approached it from different spaces because you've written a lot of books for grown-ups, and I've written a lot of books for very young people. So for me, uh, it was also I had to get over the anxiety that I had is because I'm known as the lunch lady guy in writing these happy and cheery graphic novels for young people or picture books and wanting to, also when the book was, was publishing, to signal boost to everyone that this, uh, you know, this wasn't a middle grade book. And graphic memoir is very popular in middle grade. And so I think a lot of people had assumed this was going to be middle grade. So uh, via the, the tagline of the title, so it's Hey Kiddo, How I, How I Lost My Mother, Found My Father, and Dealt With Family Addiction, d down to the color palette uh, that didn't feel like middle grade. So uh, I had to get to the point where, um, I had to have uh, the courage to write the book, and I gained that courage from, from meeting so many of my young readers who also had addiction in their lives, who, who had a, maybe a parent who was either incarcerated or had died of an overdose. Uh, and it was through those interactions that I realized that these, these young people really needed the story. And what, what age reader were you picturing when you wrote it? I always thought of it as young adults, so 12 so and up. 12 and um, up. But I, do, you know, but I will say, though, when I was on book tour, I was very conscious of the fact that you know, uh, if I saw someone coming in with a, a much younger reader, I thought, well, they're here because they think it's Jedi Academy or Lunch Lady. And so, but I had uh, uh, quotes that would, that would pull up about people, what people were saying about the book while they were sitting. So I thought, that's going to be a signal boost. If they need to leave, they can. Because uh, I don't want to let anyone th feel like they're unwelcome to be there. And there was one event uh, where there was, this one reader was nine years old. And when they came through the book signing line, and, and she was there because her eldest brother, who was 12, died of a, a drug overdose. Uh, and so sometimes people would say to me, well, it says 12 and up, but I would wait till maybe 14, to which I would say, like, that's your choice. But look, my mother started using drugs when she was 13 years old. And there are difficult truths in people's lives, in our lives, in humanity. And I personally, with my own children, the way we raise them is best to experience that through the comfort of a book before they have to face it in the harshness of reality. And Monica? Yeah. Thank you. You know, you, you mentioned that I also write for adults. Uh, I don't approach writing YA any differently than I, uh, than I approach writing for adults. I don't, I don't try to soften themes. I don't try to soften language. I don't try to soften feelings. I think that when we say that teenagers aren't ready to read something, what we often mean is that their parents are not ready for <laughs> to them to read that. Their parents yeah. are not ready to have Very that conversation. Well um, but, but I think about when I was 15, 16, 17, the kinds of, the kinds of things I was thinking about and the kinds of things I was trying to process um, were the same things I struggle with the, with now, and and so I, I try to give my my characters the dignity and the intelligence that I think that I think a lot of teenagers have if we give if we empower them and give them the respect to believe that they already have it. So when you were looking at doing your research on the internment camps. Um, did you feel, were you looking at our current situation um, with you know, the, the camps on the borders for migrants and refugees, or, were, or was this beforehand? Before yeah, that? I mean, it was really fascinating because I started writing this book um, before the, the border crisis was, was in popular news. And, and my book is set in Crystal City, Texas, which is very, it's a very specific camp called Crystal City Family Internment Camp. And then um, about halfway into my research and writing process, um, we started hearing about these migrant camps in, in Texas, just a few miles away from where this internment camp had been set. And, and the way that we talked about internment then and justified internment then and the language we used was so similar to the language that we use now. So it was, it was hard to not see parallels. Mm -hmm. And actually, maybe you should um, explain a little bit about the lives of the teenagers, because one thing you did do in the book that was interesting is dig up this bit of history that people might not know about, that there were actually German Americans incarcerated or in internment camps along with Japanese Americans. Yeah, so Crystal City, uh, I, I won't, I promise I won't turn this into a long, boring history, but if you ever come hear me talk alone, I will, and I'll <laughs> give you a whole history. Um, so Crystal City Family Internment Camp was the 
only internment camp in the United States that had both Japanese American and German American families. And it was a camp that was specifically created for people they believed to be spies. So if you were there, they, they had evidence against your family, as flimsy and specious as that evidence might have been. Um, but if you were a child growing up there or a teenager growing up there, the government decided that they wanted this to be a, a model camp. So they had a prom. A prom. <laughs> they had a football team. They had a football team that had a, an absolutely perfect winning record. Can anyone guess why a football team in an internment camp had a winning record? <laughs> because they couldn't play anyone else because they were in a prison. So, um, so all of those facets I thought were really fascinating and, and belonged in a novel. Um, and maybe, you know, everyone here is obviously a YA fan, but maybe we should also have both of you explain what it is that you think is the difference between a YA book and a book that's written for adults but about teenagers. What are you trying to do by making your book, Good your question. story, YA? I think that it's from the point of view of a teenager, I would say. I mean, that's what I, how I would approach it, like the, the voice. So I wrote Hey Kiddo specifically with my 16, 17 year old voice. Mm -hmm. So there's some pieces that I didn't, I didn't give that character the knowledge that I later gained. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are some elements in the story that I had to communicate to the reader. And when that happened, I communicated it through the art and not through the narration. Um, but I mean, I think, I mean, it's like you said, like there, there's nothing stopping a teenager from reading one of your books that was written and then say, not written for, but then marketed towards. Yeah. Adults, right? I mean, I think that the only, the, the only difference that I think about is, is that I think a lot of teenagers live with their hearts a lot closer to the surface yes. than a lot of adults do. Um, and part of that is just due to the fact that they haven't, they haven't kind of gotten the protective shell yet that we learn to get for better or worse as adults. They're and as calloused. Yeah, they haven't gotten as, as calloused. Um, and a lot of that is due to the fact that they're living in circumstances that are often beyond their control. Yes. Um, so, so I try to reflect that in my writing. But yeah, and there's also the enthusiasm of experiencing life for the first time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, like so, so it, one way I look at it is a grown-up novel is kind of looking back at the experience of being a teenager, yeah. and even if the teenager is the main character, you have a sense of it, an adult yeah. sensibility, yes. whereas in a YA book, you're right there in the middle of being a teenager, and you, like you say, you really don't know what's gonna happen next. Yeah. Um, so when you travel around the country talking to teenagers about your books, could you tell us about some of the reactions that you get and some of the ways that you have come to know your readers and what you've learned from them? Well, I've come to recognize uh, the body language and the expressions on one's face when they might want to share a similar experience. And uh, there, there have been moments in, in schools and libraries and bookstores where uh, that might be the first time the young person spoke aloud what they were dealing with, uh, which is a very empowering thing for a young person. Um, uh, to the point where uh, there's this young, he was probably 10 or 11, he confided in me that his, his father was incarcerated and he just broke down in tears and sobs. You know, um, then of course the adults were like, oh, we want to take a picture with the author. I'm like, let him have a moment, <laughs> you know? <laughs> then we'll take a photo, we, I'll be here for a little bit. You know, so, uh, and I think as a young person too, I remember the first adults that I uttered some of those truths and what a, what a weight. Is, is lifted, was lifted off my shoulders then. And, the, and but in your case, it, it wasn't through an author, right? The, these, For me, it was, yeah. it was other adults. Right, you know? so it's kind and, of amazing that you guys go and meet kids and you have become kind of a, a, a way that they can deal with their own experience. And it's almost safe because they're, they're not gonna see me the next day. They, they, they take, they give that to the person they know that I can understand, they know that I've, I've lived with it and then I'm off to wherever I'm off to and they're hopefully, and, and then hopefully too, maybe there's another person, that, if it happens at a school, I and mean, I certainly, if, if another adult isn't right there to hear it, I make sure, like there was one instance where I was handed a note that had some really difficult truths and I you know, have to give this to the librarian, like this mm -hmm. is something that you need to help this young person. You know, right. Yeah. I can't be that person right. on the ground. But you said that you meet them for one day and you leave, but your book stays with them. Yes. Yeah. You know, and that's making a difference. And it's a safe space to encounter yeah. these things. And, 
That's really true. But Monica, have you had experiences meeting your readers that have surprised you and moved you? I mean, I, I would live in a high school if I could because I think <laughs> like, like humans between the ages of 14 and 17 are just the most magical humans. Um, but what I, what I love are the connections that they make that are so much smarter than what I even intended to make uh -huh. in the book. Um, in, in my first YA book, Girl in the Blue Coat, which is set in the Dutch resistance of World War II, there's a group of, um, there's a group of young people who join Underground Camera which was a real resistance organization where photographers were taking, were documenting secret photographs of Nazi atrocities. And it was run mostly by teenagers. Um, and, and they were doing this to sort of say, we're not gonna let you lie about what happened later. We're gonna document this, this happened. And I was in a high school and I said this and one of the students was like, oh, like we use our camera phones to film the police. And I was like, oh my God, yes. that's, so, <laughs> like, that's so brilliant, um, this, this impulse to, to use what means are at your disposal to speak truth to power, to, to make sure to bear witness. And um, so I, I am always learning about things that are in my books that I didn't even know were in my books until, until some smart young reader tells me they were. Um, and just to get back to our idea of difficult topics and how sometimes they're easier for the teenagers than the adults, um, can you talk a little bit about reactions you've had from adults that maybe have been surprising or challenging as you're, as you're trying to get your message out? I, I, you know, I had a lot of anxiety before Hey Kiddo was published. Uh, just wondering what I would be confronted with of, pe of people who didn't think it would be appropriate. But I honestly, I, knock on wood, I mean, I haven't had one instance pop up where someone said, this doesn't belong in this library, or this doesn't belong with this reader. Um, I, I perhaps, because also a lot of adults have those same conversations with me that the teens do. And sometimes it's because of their own lives, maybe they're the parent, or maybe it's because of their children's addiction. Uh, you know, sometimes I've, I've met a lot of grandparents who are raising grandchildren as well. Mm -hmm. I think most of my experiences, most of my interactions with adults that, that are my favorites are really um, actually wonderful experiences. I, I, heard from, um, I heard from a man who had read the Dutch translation of one of my books, Girl in the Blue Coat, who, who said, my father was Anne Frank's teacher. And, um, oh. and he died before I could ask him about what Amsterdam was like then. And I, you know, I learned about Amsterdam through this. Or I heard from a woman whose mother had been um, a prisoner at, at Crystal City internment camp and, and who, who refused to talk about it until she died. And so I like hearing from a, adults who, um, who are getting to learn about their own experiences via novels. I, I do get... Um, I, I have gotten responses from adults who say this isn't appropriate for children. I had um, um, a librarian of all people tell me she wasn't going to carry Girl in the Blue Coat because it had a gay character in it. And I felt really sad for her, for her students. Her and, and I felt sad for her thinking that you could protect protect your students from learning about something that they already know exists and is normal to exist. Yeah. So. And, um, you know, Jared, it occurred to me after I read your book that it's actually a historical novel in a way. So <laughs> a lot of research. Yeah. Right, because it's, it's set in sort of the 19... 80s and 90s. Yeah, which is now... His, and some so, 40s too, I go back into the 40s. Go, right, too. oh that's true, the, your grandparents' yeah. courtship. Yeah. Scene, but so so we could talk about both of you as historical novelists now. Um, how do you as old as that makes <laughs> so many people feel? It's true. You know you're in trouble when like the American Girl doll company rolls out with a doll from when you grew up. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Her name's Jennifer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. She has Jiffy Pop. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Um, wacky packages. I just. Yes. Do you have yeah. That? yeah. <laughs> So uh, could you talk a little bit about that, about writing for teenagers living in this world today, which is so different, I mean, especially obviously from, from World War II, 
Um, but how do you think about that, about speaking to teenagers living in our world now about the way teenagers lived in a different time period? I mean, all of the emotions are the same, just the technology. Yeah. You know, I grew up with The Wonder Years, my favorite TV show, which was set in the 50s and 60s. But I, that, didn't, that time difference didn't mean that I couldn't project myself onto Paul Pfeiffer, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Like, that was me and Pat growing up. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that, I, I always think that historical fiction is, is never really about the past. It's about today and just finding a different way to talk about it. Yeah. Um, I will say, though, I was talking with Phyllis Reynolds Naylor. Do you guys know her, Shiloh, the Alice books? Yeah. So um, she, she and I were talking about this, and she said that she prefers to write books um, set in the past because the more you write in the past, the more current your books will feel. If you write something set now and you have like a bunch of a bunch of kids using TikTok, it'll seem like it'll work now. Next year, it'll be like oh, it's over. Like yeah. it's, it's over. It's it's like it's already passed. So, um, so I will say that that writing in the past allows things to to feel actually presence and and not uh, not dated. That's so interesting. Wow. Because right, like kids could totally more relate to say passing notes than like logging into MySpace. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. You know, or Friendster. Right. If you're really from the early 80s. <laughs> yeah. And also, like when you write in like, like today, there are so many there are so many problems and situations in my books that could have been solved if people had a cell phone. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's nice to be like writing in an era where it's just like not an option. You like right. you have to find you your have way to out bring of this. that note yeah. over in person. Yeah. But there is something about just you go down a rabbit hole. Like even though like it's hey kiddo is a memoir, I would find this letter, which led to that letter, which led me to learn things I never knew about. Yeah. And I'm sure, that definitely, you experienced that, I'm sure. S scratching at the surface and leading from one thing to the next. Yeah, I mean, in research, I usually start off with like a, I, I start off with a, a time and place and a vague idea, and then I just go bury myself for a couple of weeks in the National Archives or the Library of Congress or something, and then, and, and just sort of digging in, like, well, what would this look like? Where could that happen? Where would that take place? And what a gift to have these institutions. So I worked with the Worcester Historical Museum uh, because there are a lot of buildings that are no longer standing that are featured in the book, like the elementary school I attended. And so I worked with them to find uh, archival photographs of some of these spaces. Yeah. So, you know, the 1% of the people who will read Hey Kid who also attended that building, they'll recognize it. But then for everyone else, you're like, oh, that looks like a real place from a real time. Mm -hmm. Even though you were never seeing it in person with your own eyes. Yeah. Because you had the Because I could draw what, what I would see from the photo, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, one other cool thing about having these two with us is we have the two sides of what's really exciting and current in YA, which is the graphic memoir and novel side and then the straight up novel side. Um, and it's so good to have you in conversation with each other to see how they're, they're really doing the same thing. But could, could you talk a little bit about, um, sometimes a, when I talk to writers, they are jealous of the illustrators because they get to convey things with their pictures visually. But then when I talk to the illustrators, they're jealous of the writers, the straight writers, because they get to fill in history and things that you can't do in a picture. Um, so do you, can, do you guys, could you talk a little bit about how writing just words is different than writing with words and pictures and, and how maybe both are the, the, the best thing for kids is to have both in their life? I think they definitely should have both in like a wide array of, of literature. I mean, if you probably, it's probably tough to answer that question because you've never illustrated a book. No. I've never just written. But right? what, I, what I am really <laughs> curious to know about is, um, is you, you've all heard the term like, are you a plotter or a pantser? Yes, okay. So. Um, and in case some people didn't, what does that mean? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you asked for the few people who didn't know. Um, so, so people often say that novelists are plotters or pantsers, and plotters know where things are going, like from the beginning to the end, they have chapter outlines, they're these like yeah. beautiful organized unicorns. And pantsers are like me, and then you, like, you just sit down, like vomit words for a couple of hours, and then go eat a Pop-Tart. Like seed and, of the, like, <laughs> seed of the, coming, it, it comes yeah, from seed like, of the probably like, see a doctor about that, that. Your and a nutritionist. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> But like, so, but I always feel like 
I can fly by the seat of my pants because I only, I, I only have a Word document. Right. And I wonder, do you have to be more organized in your process and more meticulous about where you're going? That's a great question. Yes and no. So I start by writing everything. I use uh, uh, Final Draft, which is a, a screenwriting software. You know, so it's, all, it's written out like a script, just like a movie would be. Character's name, dialogue, character's name, dialogue, stage direction, what you're going to see in the art. And I can more, I mean, I kind of have a big picture idea, right? So I guess even before I do that, for, for at least for Heikido, I wrote ideas on Post-its, like memories on Post-it notes and tried to organize them. But when it comes to the art, it has, you're so, everything is so carefully planned because there's this thing called the page turn, right? Like there's the art of a page turn, which I learned from making picture books for so many years. And by that, what I mean is, Say if your character is going to open the door of a shed to see if there's a monster in there. When you get to the bottom right hand corner of those, of that, those two open pages, you should not reveal if the monster is there. I call that the hand on the doorknob moment. So the character has their hand on the doorknob, and for that split second when the reader turns the page, they're there with the character. It's, it's a constant moment for little mini cliffhangers. Yeah. And so, and sometimes when you turn the page, maybe you'll have a full page spread where the, the, the monster's jumping out at you. So with that, if something prior to that needs to get edited and your page count goes off, you have to, you have to make amends for that. Yeah, so you're not only thinking that this has to, ha like I'm thinking this chapter has to end in a cliffhanger, but for you it's right. as specific as like, this has to happen on page three, not page four, because that's where the- You're gonna turn the, the page turn to see what's on the other end. side. So for instance, in Hey Kiddo, uh, at the end of, I think, chapter seven, uh, you know, I, I receive, I'm getting the mail. And, you, and, and you're like, oh, something that I said, and then you turn the page and it's a full page spread close on the character's face when you realize that the character, me, is hearing from their father for the first time. All right. Did you ever think about writing a book that's just words, or will you always want to work? Is, is thinking yeah. visually just too organic to your It is process? very organic. I, I have had a story knocking around in my head where I think the, um, the illustrations might give away some of the aspects ah. of the story. Uh, and so it, it may be pictureless. You know, it might be just prose. Wow. So we'll see. I mean, I, I wrote the Platypus Police Squad books were written as prose within using big pieces of illustrations to help expand what was happening in the art. Wow. So a little bit less 50-50. Interesting. Well, I've, it makes me think of Wonder, for example, right? It's so great that we don't know what right. Augie looks like in yeah. the book, at least. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, because that would take, take something away from our own Imagine. imagining. Um, but Monica, many word writers these days are writing scripts for graphic novels, sort of teaming up with an illustrator. Is that something that you would be interested in or oh, man. think about? Um, I will say that, like, so my, my background is in journalism. I was a journalist before I was a novelist. And one of the things that, that journalism is really good at is making you attuned to dialogue and how, how people actually speak. Because when you're getting quotes exactly right, you realize that they're often not these beautiful Shakespearean sentences. They, like, fall off in the middle. There are mm -hmm. likes and ums and haws. And, like, I, I try to put those in, into dialogue. And so... Um, Whenever I'm having just like a really awful writing day, I let myself just do pages and pages of dialogue because oh. I, I love that and it's easy. Yeah. So I could see that transitioning into a graphic novel as long as you know someone else was doing all of the illustrating. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, someone else was taking Not care see of their all family that. for yeah. a month, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's, yeah. Uh, we should talk about the relative time frames of writing a graphic book like Hey Kiddo and writing a straight novel because the, the graphic books are, are very uh, time consuming. Very time consuming, so a lot of hours. Uh, so I devour audiobooks and podcasts because sometimes when I listen to just straight music, then my mind drifts. I, I need to, my butt needs to be in the chair. When I'm making the art, a lot of the, the story, all of the storytelling decisions have been made. Right, so anything that's kind of is, inking and I'm just inking and drawing and inking and replicating and taking it to final. So anything that gets this part of my brain really engaged, so I can just sit for hours on end. Wow. Yeah. And how, how long do your novels generally take? Um, if I am a good girl 
and I have done everything the way that I plan on doing it. A, a novel would take 80 days because I write, wow. I write a thousand words yeah, a day, and and they're about 80,000 words. Um, and I'm I'm really disciplined. I always try to be really honest with people that to write a book, you either have to be just wildly talented or wildly disciplined, and the first you don't have so much control over, but the second you do. So, um, but wait, I thought you said you were a pantser. Well, <laughs> I mean, w once I sit down, there's like it's anybody's okay. guess what's no, going to. but you are. The like, point is, what like sitting horror down. is going to end okay. up on the page? I get but, it. Like the point is that I will make myself sit down, and I'm not going to get up until there are a thousand words. But it is yeah. amazing how much external factors like. Am I hungry? Am I feeling okay today? Yeah. Am I sick? Am I feeling depressed? Like, and what time of day is it? Well, now it's one, and now I'm exhausted, and oh, and I have to pick up the kids from school. So, like, yeah. you really have to know when you're going to be at your best to just get that. And make that your writing yeah. or drawing time. Yeah, I mean, I don't. To, to be clear, I've never actually finished a novel in in eight right, days right. because because the... life gets in yeah. the way. Yeah. But I think you learn that creativity is something is like a muscle that you can that you can grow and you can flex so that. Um, on the days when you don't feel inspired, you can still force yourself to sit down and do work. And it might not be your best work, and it might be work that you erase the next day, but... Um, that helps but you, you can, get to the next day. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but you still need to go through the slump to get where you're right. trying to go. Interesting. Well, we only have about 10 more minutes before we're gonna open it up for all of your questions. Why don't we talk a little bit about other books that you want to bring to the attention of our audience that you think are kind of exciting and doing the, you know, making YA into uh, what it's becoming and that are taking us to this ne the next place because there's so many great YA books right now. Um, and I think historical, I would say the two of the really strongest parts of YA are historical fiction and graphic memoirs and novels. So it's great to have you guys here. So can you give us some, some shout outs to some other books that you're interested in? Sure, well, I think that we'll, we'll see more and more young adult graphic memoir. You know, it's been, like I said, it's been huge in the, in the middle grade space. Um, so I'll, I'll give a shout out to my friend Mike Corrado. Uh, he, he, you might know him from the Little Elliot books. Uh, he's just finishing up the art for his, uh, it's, a, it's a young adult graphic novel loosely based on his own life. And it's called Flamer. And it's about a boy who is uh, biracial who comes out as gay at a, uh, a sleepaway camp in the, the mid 1990s. Oh, wow. When is that coming out? Fall I can't wait to see that. Yeah, that sounds great. great. The, the art um, is beautiful, too. Fantastic. Any other any books that you've been excited about? Mark? Well, I just <laughs> downloaded onto my Kindle, and I'm very excited to read Ruta Zapetti's new book. And I'm oh, sure anyone, yeah. Who, yeah, anyone who reads historical fiction knows Ruta's work. Um, don't spoil it for me if any of you have read this before me. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to read that. I also, the, the, the favorite YA book that I read of last year, which again, I'm sure many of you have read, was uh, Sadie by Courtney Sumner. Oh yeah, Thriller. That's another, yeah. another genre that's, um, that's really hot right now yeah. in YA. Now that's fantastic. Um, uh, anything else? Any, we, can, we can open it to questions soon, but let's just give a few more, a few more um, shout outs to other, other books to... Uh, I'm going to be honest because my bookshelf is so boring because I've been, well, no, my bookshelf is fascinating, but um, <laughs> I've been, I've been, for the last six months, I've been working on a book set in uh, Poland in 1945 after the war. Everything on my bookshelf is related has a to title you. of like food yeah. rationing in yeah. Warsaw <laughs> 1948. So I'm not the best to okay, ask Okay, okay. Like, well, that's good. That's good to know, right though, now. that that's what you have to do when you're really hard at work. But what about what about? Okay, I'll more? throw it, another book on your radar that's not out quite yet. Uh, his name is Jonathan Todd, and he's someone who uh, I've been talking to for a number of years now about getting published, and I'm so, so psyched for him. His book is called Timid. Uh, it's an upper middle grade uh, graphic memoir, and it's about his own experience being black at a predominantly white school and then how he navigates the friendships when uh, other children of color who come in from the inner city and, and where, his, where, where his culture is and how he feels he fits in between the different groups. Fantastic. Well, these are all good, good recommendations. Um, can we, um, do we have someone to uh, use a mic or can, can we have our questioners just? There's a mic right there and right there. Oh, okay. Or you could just speak really loudly. Or we could, oh, oh. How, so the question was, how long do you write for and how long do you read each day? Um, 
there's no, uh, yeah, every day is so different. I've got, I have three children at home and they're, yeah, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, so for me, um, I had, I work for the Wash. I'm a columnist for the Washington Post full time. So I'm writing, um, I'm writing every. So buy her a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm writing every day for eight hours a day and then I come home and I write for two or three more. Wow. So um, it's uh, a lot, it's, it's. I, I kind of have no other hobbies or life to speak of. <laughs> but that's a remarkable life. I yes. Have, I have a dog. Yeah. The, the dog gets you out doing the walking. She's a good yeah. companion for, yeah. for writing. Dogs are good for self-care. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, my question is, I love the stories that I hear about graphic novels. Like, I really want to read them, but then I read them and, like, you're done in a day. And so, like, oh. you can, you can, like, really sink into a historical novel and, like, really, like, ex you know, just feel like you're in that universe. Uh, what my question is, how do I do that with a graphic novel? Well, how, how long, so the question is, so it probably would be easier if people go to the mic, right, uh, so we could all hear. So I think your question was, when you're reading something that's prose, you could really spend a lot of time with it, but in a graphic novel, you feel like you're done in the day. And so my question back to you would be, well, how much time are you spending reading the pictures? Because what you might be doing is, as adults, and even when I'm reading picture books to my children, I sometimes breeze past the illustrations, but remember that just like picture books with graphic novels, half of the story is told with the art. And so we have to take a moment to read the pictures very carefully uh, because there's going to be all sorts of other information in there. And yes, when you are spending years trying to make this book and you hear someone's read it in a day, you're like, oh, it took me so long to make that. But not all graphic novels, but not all graphic novels are the same as well. You're going to have some graphic novels that are very text heavy. And you're going to have some, some graphic novels that are very illustration heavy. And to take the time to read all of the art will take you longer as well. And I find graphic novels, uh, I reread probably more often than I reread um, straight novels. And it might be for this reason, because I find something new each time yeah. um, in, the, in the pictures. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, this is mostly for Jarrett, um, if you can tell me what it's been like for you to have people essentially know your story and feel like they really know you when yeah. they don't actually know you. It's a good question. So what is it like when, when people know me but they don't really know me? Um, when the book was first published, a lot of people s tweeted to me selfies of themselves crying. Uh, that was kind of, I was like, I'm glad to have that direction. And then I felt that people wanted to hug me when they saw me because I'm the physical manifestation of this character that they spent so much time with. Um, and, but because I delivered a TED Talk some years prior, I was prepared for that. So having given that TED Talk, putting myself out there uh, really helped me navigate. Obviously, uh, talk therapy helps quite a bit with everything in life, right? And so I wouldn't have gotten through writing the book if it weren't going to talk therapy on a regular basis or having gone out to tour for it as well. I'm, uh, I'm a therapist myself, so I appreciate that. That's great. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and also, so I know here's a question that most people ask. They ask, because there's a scene in third grade where I get my finger caught in an escalator railing, and yes, there is still a scar. And, and sometimes if I do this, it makes a little sound right there. You can't hear it. I, I... Uh, <laughs> Pretty gross, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we go on this side? Um, so I was wondering, um, for, this is question is for Jared specifically about the graphic memoir creation, um, how you approached painting people who were still in your life in a negative light, or just as versions of them that you felt were like very personal? Like did you ask, did you talk to people about the graphic novel before you gave yourself permission to do that and let go or did you just do it and hope for the best? <laughs> I'm wondering well, if, like personally I, working on writing. So. I, I have uh, either learned of or talked to enough people who've written memoir whose, whose family dynamics have shifted in a negative way because of writing memoir. So I was very conscious of having these conversations as dark as it sounds, it does help to outlive people <laughs> when you're writing about what happened, right? Um, and so I, I had a lot of people, I, anyone who was in the family and featured in the book and still with us, I had them read early drafts to see 
uh, if, if my memory served me correctly, uh, the best piece of advice I received about writing memoir, I, I went to go see a lecture by David Sedaris, and just like you, I was sitting in the crowd and then raised my hand, which I understand takes a lot of courage, like, oh, well, they called on me, now I have to talk in front of all these people. And, and so I asked him, how did his family, how does his family deal with that? And he said, well, I, I don't reveal any of their secrets. So one, I was like, what the hell are their secrets? I know. <laughs> but two, also, he was so right, and so I don't reveal any of my family's, any of their secrets. You know, my mother has passed, and when we die, stories are all we leave behind to those that are still on this earth. Um, so that's what I inherited from her. So I, I, I navigated it in a way that was sensitive to other people's needs as well. Thank you. Oh. Okay, we're gonna have to wrap it up. Can we do one more question? One more? Okay, let's do one, one more over here. Uh, so I'm kind of a little bit of a digital art kind of person. So um, I do have a few, I just have one question. Yeah, very brief question. Um, let's see, how did you get started on drawing? And uh, as a young teen, can you write a book early and then publish it when you're an adult? And well, you know, I, I just always love to draw, uh, you know, for, for the young artists that are in the room, I would say for now, just focus on the joy of the craft and working on your craft. Don't worry about getting published or quote unquote famous uh, because your work is gonna change so much over the years. Uh, and so your work is a, a, a constant evolution. So just enjoy the process. Can we do, can we do one more? Are they, are they banging at the door? So, you think? Okay, let's. let's. Um, so, like a couple months ago, I went to the Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C., and there were a lot of teens there wearing MAGA hats. Um, if you were in my place, would you say anything to them? And if so, what would that be? I guess this one is for Monica, since you've yeah. dealt with them. <laughs> they were, this is as a MAGA Are you sure hats. we're not at MAGA, time. make America great <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, right. So as a columnist and an author of books uh, set during the Holocaust. Um, first of all, you should never feel like you have to put yourself in a situation where you don't feel safe. So deciding whether or not to approach a group of strangers that you don't know in a public space is a, is a really on the ground, in the moment, decision. Um, if you do feel like you're in a space where you want to have a dialogue or have a conversation, I think that one of the things that the Holocaust teaches us and that periods of history teach us is that symbols are important and symbols are meaningful. And regardless of what their intentions of wearing that hat might be, um, it's grown to mean something to a, to a lot of people. Um, and I think that it is, it is worth having the dialogue that just says, when I see that symbol, this is what I hear. And this is what it makes me think of. And when you put that on your head, is that what you're trying to say? And is that the kind of personality you're trying to convey? Um, not in an accusatory way, but in a way that's just saying, this is the message that you're putting out. Do you want to be the kind of person that puts out that message? Okay, thank you. Right, good. Thank you so much. Um, reminder, thank you all. Are we still on? We'll be here. Well, thank you, Maria uh, Russo. Yes, Russo, thank you. Russo. Russo. Oh my! I'm a pantser. Okay, I'm a pantser. I, you have me. I thought there was going to be someone else introducing us. <laughs> Been waiting also, for that all panel. <laughs> our wonderful authors are going to be signing. Um, where Where are you signing? Uh, about uh, eight, I believe. Okay, so please. And I'm um, next door. Yeah, right yeah, next door. Right next door. <laughs> row seven, I think. Conveniently. Um, In the so basement. Please, so please come and um, bring your books. And thank you again for being thank here. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you.